images from the book that aren't actually that are things that aren't actually on display upstairs and talk a little bit about why the exhibition is taking this slightly unusual format. You'll see, those of you who have already looked around it upstairs, that there are a lot of QR codes and quite a heavy digital element. Um, and I thought it might be interesting for you to hear why we've made that choice <coughs> and some of the implications. So I'll show you, this is a, um, a shot from last week in the middle of setup that we, uh, we called the ghost room of all the mannequins ready to go out on display. Um, I think they're a bit, a bit creepy there. <laughs> anyway, um, the idea behind Connecting Threads came from the collection. Um, hidden away in cupboards and drawers and various boxes throughout the house, there turned out to be quite a large costume and textiles collection that really wasn't very well catalogued or documented. Now, lest I give you the wrong impression, it's important to note that in museums, cataloging is a never-ending process. There's always more information that can come out of this. And I hope that part of this process will encourage that the, the information we put out at the moment is not the end of the story. Um, and indeed, just in the last few days since the book was published, I've had a message um, from uh, Jenny Sedman, who's the president of Maya Ganya House Museum, telling us a little bit more information about one of the objects in the book. And that really brings out one of the points of doing this project, which is that we get information from other experts, from the community, from visitors about the objects, we get to share them. And in the process, we can communicate to a much wider audience than just me sitting around in the cupboard, what's actually here and why it's worth looking after. And when it comes to small house museums like this, there's a great challenge in terms of storage and how do you care for these often fantastic collections that have something that bigger museums don't always have, which is that real connection to the families and the people and the stories. So many objects in the collection actually were donated by family members of people who are volunteers here, who, have, who were friends here in the past, who have other connections to the house. And in a big museum, that connection is sometimes lost and it can be regained here by doing this sort of project. One of the things that uh, the various friends and volunteers that have interacted with me in the last 18 months or so have said is always when I'm getting out um, a dress or when I was putting these up in the last week, they would always say, was that here? Was that really here? Where was it? And some of them thought maybe this came from a, um, a different collection or we'd borrowed it. Um, but no, the vast majority of what you see upstairs with two exceptions only, has been in the collection in the house, most of them for 20 years, some of them for 50 years. Um, and that gives you an idea of the size and the sort of quiet majesty of the collection in that it hasn't really been put on display. And in fact, most of these dresses have never been put on display before. There are a couple that have been put on display um, in slightly altered situations and we've recontextualized them in this process so this is more of a, of a correct vision. The other problem we have when putting on exhibitions like this is that mounting costumes is an awfully difficult process. Now if I've done my job well and you go upstairs and look at the dresses you won't notice how they're put together. They just seem to sit there, they're on mannequin, it makes complete sense. But to give you an idea this is what goes underneath the blue brocade dress that's up there in the bedroom. It was a complete nightmare to put together because the waistline on that dress is only 19 inches, which is ridiculous. <laughs> so obviously none of the existing mannequins worked. And in fact, for, a, for an 18th century silhouette dress of that age and that size, the only options are quite expensive custom mannequins that are made specifically for that period in history. Um, in case you're interested in knowing a little secret underneath the the petticoat story here. This is actually a pair of reproduction stays that are mine. They're built for me, um, so they're considerably larger than 19 inches. And the central pole is actually a piece of plumbing pipe wrapped in wadded electric tape. Now this is a, a, an exciting process, and, um, and it seems to work quite well upstairs with that dress. But it gives you an idea that it's not a case of just getting these dresses out of the cupboard, whacking them on a mannequin you can buy from the shop, that's it. It's quite an involved process. And sadly, many of the dresses in the collection are not in good enough condition or are in an appropriate size, nor do we have the time or the space to put them all on display. To give you an idea, there are about 20 items 
physically in the exhibition, there are a great deal more involved in the story if you start to scan the page as you go around. And that's one of the reasons we chose to do that, to bring in these objects in a digital but site-specific way. So you have to be here to look at them. So you understand these objects as part of the story as you step out, but we don't have to limit ourselves to what we can physically display in the house itself. Um, the other reason we love this is, as I mentioned, for conservation. So I'm going to move on to slightly taking you through some of the objects in Connection Threads. Most of these are objects in the book, so if any of you have been diligent and read it from cover to cover already, then I apologise for anything that might be a bit repetitive. I'm going to start with this, which is actually physically on display in the cabinet down there, and when we go for a walk around the exhibition, you'll see it. Um, and it's another example of something that's drawn some connections between us and other institutions by bringing it out of the cupboard, researching it, and putting it in the exhibition. Um, this is a camisole, as you can see, that was supposedly part, once part of Kate Leslie's wedding dress. Now, Kate Leslie is, of course, if you've read these, um, the book in, involved in the house or any of these wonderful shrines, you will know she was the first proper mistress here at Newstead. Now, there are a couple of issues that come up when you look at this. Um, first things first, it's clearly no longer a wedding dress. Uh, the story that's attached to it says it was actually a part of the <laughs> underskirt, um, which may be a, a decorative petticoat that was partially visible in the dress or may have been completely covered. Um, but the issue is you start looking at it and you can see this watered look, it's called moire fabric, and this shade of purple they see, which is actually much more commonly associated with synthetic dyes, um, and certainly without doing the proper chemical testing, you can never be 100% sure, but uh, my opinion and my research has turned up this is very much a synthetic style purple, um, which means that it has to date from the period after which that was invented. Now the problem is Kate Met Leslie was married in 1840, which is before that date, and that starts to unravel one of the themes that uh, crosses all of this, this exhibition and the book which is that the fashions that people wore throughout the 18th century and the 19th century and into the 20th century didn't stop when they were worn for the first time. They had a life that extended beyond just that moment of purchasing them and wearing them. We know that in our own clothes, even though we don't mend them and keep them quite as much as they did in the past, we do still sometimes, you know, they get a bit of a rub in one corner or they put a ladder in your pipes and that starts to become part of the nature of the object. We look at the dress as an object, all the signs of grabbing it as part of that story. This case, it's not damage, it's new use. Someone has probably taken that fabric, cut it, and turned it into this. If you see these shapes here, these gussets, this is actually a sewing technique often used in corsetry and underwear, um, suggesting that this was not, you know, a kind of beach style lounge camisole, it was actually a, a, an undergarment. Um, and it's quite straight, as you can see got this straight back, which suggests that it's probably a shape from earlier into the 20th century. Um, so it's a bit of a mystery, first things first, you know, when was it re-dyed, when was it remade? Um, one of the things that's turned up is, again, from Maya Dunya, they also have a piece of this fabric that is also supposedly from Kate Leslie's wedding dress. So bits of this dress have been cut up and ended up all over the place, which I think is a really fascinating part of this history, both of Kate's life and of this particular object. And here you see some other Leslies. Um, this is William and Emma Leslie's daughters. So this is the granddaughters of, of Kate Kirkpatrick. Um, and you can see here that they're wearing some quite somber and austere looking Victorian dresses. And um, it's supposed that this is actually because um, they were in mourning for Patrick at the time this photograph was taken. Um, and regardless of whether or not that's true, you can see some of the style of dresses that were worn in that later Victorian period. We've got 1881 up here, which is certainly a period in which people would have been living in this house, not the Leslies by that point, but just this family. Um, this is stepping back a little bit further um, into the 1860s-ish. We don't have a specific date on these photographs, um, but these were sitting in the resource center across the road um, and I'm not quite sure where they turned up from one day, but we 